We're now going to finish up talking about two more principles. One is Pascal's principle, and the other is Bernoulli's principle. And Pascal's principle is actually fairly interesting. And what it states is if you apply pressure to a liquid in a closed container, the pressure increase that is applied or that is caused will be distributed equally throughout the liquid. So for example, if you push on this little hole, which it represents a stopper, the pressure that you cause by pushing on that is applied equally all through the surface of that container. Now there's a, there's a reason that's very important and it's the concept of hydraulics. Hydraulics uses Pascal's principle to multiply a force in a device. If the pressure into a device is equal to the pressure output of the device, therefore the force divided by the area of input is equal to the force divided by the area of the output. And if you look and rearrange this, that means the force output is equal to the force input multiplied by the area of the output over the area of the input. So for example, if you apply a force over a small area on the left, that force is multiplied by the increase in area on the right. And so you can use that to use a small force to lift a large object. And this is how hydraulic lifts, presses, jacks, various other machines like that work. So let's take a look at a couple of problems that show how this principle works. The large piston of a hydraulic lift has a radius of 250 square centimeters. What, is the, what force must be applied to the small piston with a radius of 25 square centimeters in order to raise the, a, a car whose mass is 1,500 kilograms? So let's see how we would do that. Now remember, we just said that the, the pressure in is going to equal the pressure out, and that means the force in divided by the area in is equal to the force out divided by the area out. And so we know the output that we want, 1500 kilograms. And so we need to solve for F1 in, force in. So that's going to equal F out times the area input divided by the area output. So that's going to be 1500 and I'm not going to change this to force units because we can just we can just look at kilograms because it's all going to be multiplied by 9.8 if we did that. The area input is 20 is a radius of 25 square centimeters so that's going to be pi times 25 squared. The area output is going to be pi times 250 squared. The pi's fortunately cancel each other out and you're left with 1500 times 25 squared divided by 250 squared. That's going to equal 15 kilograms. Now if you want to express this in force you would just multiply this by 9.8 and this by 9.8. You don't really have to do that. You'll just use this right here. Now in the future, we'll be changing these to force units to be accurate, but if you just say 15 kilograms, you're going to be right. Let's take a look at the second. A trash compactor pushes down with a force of 500 newtons on a 3 centimeter squared piston. So area N is 3 centimeters squared. Fn is 500 newtons. What area output, and it says causing a force of uh, 30,000 newtons. So F out is 30,000. And they want to know what the area of the output is. 
And then this is pretty straightforward. If we take this formula and write it down again, and I always recommend writing these formulas down because otherwise you get confused. Now what we want to know is this right here. So if we cross multiply, you have FO, A N, is going to equal FI, AO, and then divide both sides by FI. So you have AO is equal to FO, AI, over FI, and that's going to be equal to FO is 30,000, AN is going to be 3, divided by FN is 500. So we have 90,000 divided by 500. So the area is going to have to be 180 square centimeters. Now when you put something in fluid, you're going to cause something called fluid displacement. And fluid displacement leads to something known as buoyancy. Buoyancy is the amount of weight an object loses when it's placed in a fluid. The buoyant force is the force exerted on a solid object by a fluid when it's in that fluid. So if you put something in water, it's held up. It's buoyed by that water. Archimedes' principle states that the buoyant force experienced by an object is exactly equal to the weight of the fluid that that object has displaced. So whatever volume of fluid is displaced by the object, if you weigh that volume of fluid, that's how much force is, is experienced by the object. So an object that floats displaces its weight so because its, its buoyant force is equal to its weight. So it's going to displace its weight, whereas an object that sinks will displace its volume and it will lose that amount of weight as, it's being, as it sinks to the bottom. So for example, here's an example of, of Archimedes' principle. You have an object here that obviously sinks. You put it in a beaker that's filled all the way up to a point where any overflow will be caught. You play, push it, in, put it into the fluid, and you'll notice that it loses three pounds based on the scale. So the buoyant force is three pounds. And if you weigh the water that's displaced by that object, it weighs exactly three pounds. So the ball placed in the wa water sinks and the ball will weigh less than a ball in air, but it will still sink to the bottom. The hull, on the other hand, floats, and therefore the amount of water that's displaced is equal to the weight of the hull. An object in a fluid will float if it's lighter than an equal volume of fluid. That is, if you measure the volume of the object, and if that fluid weighs more than the object itself, it will float. But, on, but if it weighs less, then it will sink. Specific gravity is the ratio of the weight of an object in air to the weight of the fluid displaced by that object. Specific gravity is equal to the force, that is the weight in the air, divided by the weight in the air minus the weight in the water. So specific gravity is equal to the density of the sample divided by the density of water. And this is just a, an instrument that's used to measure density of, of certain fluids. It's called a hygrometer. Air also causes buoyant force. It is exactly the same as the fluid buoyancy. It's just that air is less dense and therefore it exerts less buoyant force. And the greater you go up in the atmosphere, the less the, the buoyant force acts. 
So the weight is opposed by the buoyant force, and if the buoyant force exceeds the weight, then the balloon will float. If, on the other hand, the weight is greater than the buoyant force, it will not float. But as it goes up, it will only go so high, and at some point there's an equalization of gravity and air pressure, and it causes it to stop rising. And the buoyant force decreases to the point where it's equal to the weight, and the balloon will, will level off. So let's do a problem or two looking at this. A 100 centimeter block of lead that weighs 11 newtons is carefully submerged in water. One cubic centimeter of water weighs this amount. What volume of water will the lead displace? Well, let's take a look at that. It's a 100 cubic centimeter block. So it, that means its volume is at 100 cubic centimeters. So the the amount, the volume of the lead is 100 cubic centimeters. And the first question here is, what volume of water does the lead displace? Well, let's assume that it, that it sinks so that its entire volume is submerged. So the volume that it displaces would be 100 cubic centimeters of water. So that would be how much water it displaced, volume-wise. How much volume does that water weigh? Well, if one cubic centimeter weighs this, 0 0.0098, then 100 cubic centimeters is going to weigh 100 times 0 0.0098 or 0 0.98 newtons. The next question is, what is the buoyant force on the lead? It's equal to the weight of the water displaced, so that's again 0 0.98 newtons. And then lastly, what does the lead weigh in the water? Well, it weighs, this is, it weighs 11 newtons in the air. In water, it's going to equal 11 minus 0 0.98 or 10.02 newtons. And that's how much it'll weigh in the water. The second problem says that a block weighs a, a thousand newtons, so its force in air is a thousand newtons. It says the block weighs 821.8 newtons in water. So first of all, you know that it just sank, okay? What is the weight of the water displaced? So it's just going to be the difference of these two numbers. So it's going to be 178.2 newtons of water was displaced. What is the volume of water displaced? Well, if you go back up to this problem and see that one cubic centimeter of water weighs this much, you have 780 newtons of water. 778.2 newtons of water and one cubic centimeter weighs this much, then this division will tell you exactly how much that weighs. So you have this many cubic centimeters of water and looking at significant figures we have one, two, three, four, five here, four here. Looks like four significant figures. So this, this would be 18,180 cubic centimeters of water. So the volume of the block is going to be 18,180 cubic centimeters. What is the density in newtons per cubic centimeter? Well, it would be the weight in air divided by the volume. So the weight in air divided by the volume, it's going to be 0 0.055 newtons per cubic centimeter. Remember, this is what water is. 
so it's quite a bit denser than water. Let's finish up with a quick discussion of Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle states that pressure exerted by a moving fluid decreases as the fluid speed increases. And that's also true of gases like air. So for example, in this diagram you have two air streams. You have one air stream here and one air stream up here. And because of the increased distance, this air stream moves slower than this airstream. And so the pressure in this faster moving airstream is less than the pressure here. So this greater pressure exerts an upward motion and causes lift. And that's how a airfoil works. And that's how we fly. An airfoil is a structure that changes the air fo force such that it produces a force. Drag is the force that's exerted to slow down an object as it moves through fluid and also moves through a gas. Streamlining is a process that's employed to reduce drag. And an airplane, these, these are the various parts of an airplane. I'm not going to go through all these. Uh, we're not going to have a quiz on the parts of an airplane. But these various parts of the airplane are, are built for two purposes. One is to generate lift and to use various principles of airflow to allow for changes in direction or height. The other is to streamline and allow the airplane to move through the air easily without with a minimum of drag. Bernoulli's principle is also used in something called a hydrofoil, which is the same as an airfoil, but it's used in water instead of air. Any object that spins as it moves through a fluid will curve in the direction of the spin. And this is important in both, this is an example of an airfoil being used, but here's an example of the use of a spin. You, you spin a ball and the direction of spin leads to its curve. And that's how you throw a curve ball.